Um, if you wouldn't mind, please put your full name and organization in the chat. That I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, we'd appreciate that. That helps us uh, keep track on who's engaged and who we need to make sure we don't that we follow up with. Um, throughout the presentation, as always, please just place questions into the chat box at any time. We'll review them during the Q&A and Q &A at the end of the presentation. And of course, as most of you know, um, the EDH for 3D and HD project is a NISGIC USGS cooperative. It's intended to engage state and local governments and the private sector partners um, and to explore options for deriving high resolution hydrographic data using 3D data, which of course is LIDAR for most of us and Alaska for the other states. I just wanted to provide a very brief project update. Um, going down, these these are a list of tasks here to the right. Um, with regards to we, this facilitating monthly webinars, you're here, so you know about them, which is great. Um, I, you should also know that the slides, and we create a Q&A doc at the end of each um, presentation, and all of those are posted in NISJIC Learning link. You do have to be logged into the website to access them. So you can go look over there and get past presentations or Q&A docs. I, I, you can collect them all. How's that? You can collect all the Q&A docs. Uh, if you do have a topic you'd like to discuss, uh, either you have interest in or would like to present, you can contact Phil or I directly and let us know. Um, with regards to our communities, we are going to have an EDH for 3D NHD interest group meeting um, at the NISJIC annual meeting. It will be in association with the 3 dep interest group. We're collectively referring to these groups as three data for the nation. It will be a breakfast meeting and because of the time period, it will be in person only. Um, however, that same week during the annual meeting, we'll be having a 3D hydrography critical factors workshop where we'll be vetting the list of critical factors and what we mean by that or what are the issues, uh, questions, uh, challenges you're facing as you work with improving hydrographic data using elevation data. And so we're trying to get an idea of the information, tools, other resource needs that would facilitate um, this work, standards, practices, things like that. That will be Friday, September 24th. During, it's the last day of the meeting. and. Um, it's 10.30 to 1 p.m. that Friday. So if you are going to the meeting, please plan to stay uh, that Friday. Don't try and scoot out that morning because we'd love to have you at the, at the session. We will, of course, after this workshop, vet the final product with the uh, EDH for 3D NHD working group. And just the last reminder, if you aren't aware of the USGS call to action on the uh, 3D hydrography program, uh, they've got that document out for review. It's a draft document. We are right now working on adjudicating the NISJIC comments for USGS. Those are due, oh, that's the wrong date. They're due Friday, August 20th. Uh, I can fix that, I think. Anyhow, it's August 20th, so they're due tomorrow. And uh, I mean, they're due Friday. And so we are working on those. If you have comments, you were not able to get into the NISJIC review, uh, feel free to submit them directly to USGS. We were just trying to uh, look for trends and, uh, you know, where people had the same questions so that we could prioritize them at some level. Uh, again, we're still, still looking for these um, 3D NHD experience inventory. If you are doing work, we're asking all of our presenters on the EDH form. If you presented, we would love for you to please go fill in. Um, as much as the inventory as you're able, it's pretty robust and we'd love to have all your information, but if you can just give us a little bit of feedback, uh, we'll take whatever you can send. If you do, if you are a private sector person or a local government person, please just let the NISJIC state representative know that you're going to contribute this information just so that they're aware and we don't have multiple projects. And um, I can put that link into the chat. This is Phil. While, while Linda's doing that, I just want to point out that one of the uses of, of this inventory is to create a dashboard or to create a, uh, a story map with the, uh, with the results so we can uh, 
people can easily see where uh, where activity has has gone on and what type it is and um, if there are any products and and kind of what's next steps as well. Very similar to what we did with uh, with three dev. All right, and again, just a quick reminder, if you've come in late, please add your name and organization to the chat. We appreciate it. So with that said, I, uh, I'm going to today to introduce Christina Kellum. She is the GIS manager for the Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, Christina has attended several NISJIC meetings and most of you have worked with her through the 3 debt program. So uh, we are glad to have Christina with us and she will introduce Josh after she talks or presents a little bit. Do I need to give you sharing privileges? Yes, please, Linda. Wish I should have done that much earlier. Just a second. Hmm. I think actually, let me just stop sharing. You should have privileges, Josh. Yep, there we go. That uh, look like it's working. Looks Excellent, good. very nice. Yes, yes looks good. All Great. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Linda, and hello, everybody. Um, I am happy to also introduce Josh Greenberg. He is our Washington State National Hydrography Data Steward. Josh joined Ecology uh, in February of this year. Uh, Anita Storr was our previous uh, NHD steward for the last 10 years, and uh, she retired at the end of June of last year, and then we had a hiring freeze, so um, we had an interim, uh, someone from my staff who'd done a lot of NHD kind of stepped up and did the work, but uh, we're really excited to have Josh uh, join our team. He has uh, taken uh, the reins and hit the ground running uh, with a lot of big ideas and um, a lot of, of things happening. Um, so we have been kind of uh, doing an information campaign, uh, presenting a, uh, a Washington NHD uh, a presentation to uh, conferences in Washington along with uh, within ecology to talk about what NHD is where we're going, and we are here now to talk about EDH. So we will we'll go over a brief history of NHD in Washington, uh, the importance of accuracy, updating the NHD, involving our stakeholders, and what's next. So first, I'll I'll, I'll talk about the history, and then I'll I'll let Josh uh, take the rest of the presentation. Um, so Ecology has been distributing the, just started distributing the one to 100,000 hydrography data set back in 2001. And we joined the Pacific Northwest Hydro Framework Partnership in which there was an effort to have a clearinghouse for hydrography data in the Northwest that was contiguous and at a higher uh, resolution. In 2009, uh, the Pacific Northwest Hydro Framework migrated to the NHD format and signed an MOU with USGS uh, uh, with the Pacific Northwest Hydro Framework and identified them as NHD stewards, which I think this is a little bit different than other states because we don't have a direct uh, 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 agreement with USGS. It's actually through the Pacific Northwest Hydro Framework Partnership. And in 2011, the NHD became a Washington State Hydrography Data Standard and identified that ecology was going to manage and maintain Washington's NHD. Since the adoption of that standard, uh, the state's focused on associating the highest priority water resources, human health, fisheries, data sets with the NHD and, and correcting the most prominent errors in the data and assisting other government agencies to adopt the NHD and provide access uh, to a variety of, of users. We have since uh, in, utilized multiple grant funding opportunities to, to do larger updates to the NHD. 
Uh, we currently are working on updating our Puget Sound shoreline based off of LIDAR data and uh, working with our Department of Fish and Wildlife to incorporate their field verified edits uh, through uh, work regarding culverts. And then most recently, uh, the governor had directed um, his office to convene state agencies to work with tribal tribes to establish a state tribal riparian protection and restoration work group. And the overall purpose of this work group is to implement a set of science-based riparian protection, restoration, and management policies uh, for a minimum standard buffer to achieve broad salmon recovery, water quality objectives, and improve climate resilience. And as part of this work group, uh, information needs and data gaps were identified, and the need to improve uh, our Washington NHD was identified as a top priority in order to uh, address stream mapping inaccuracies that currently prohibit statewide riparian assessment and monitoring program. So this work, this work group um, is delivering funding recommendations to the governor's office for the supplemental budget. And one of them is uh, referencing uh, a proposed pilot project that Ecology is submitting as a decision package for the supplemental budget. And we're proposing a two-year pilot project that identifies the technologies, methodologies, data sets and resources needed to refine and maintain the accuracy of NHD in Washington state. And the results of this pilot project will be used to inform our strategic plan and be utilized to move forward with um, submitting a next biennium funding package that will uh, incorporate how we are going to update the rest of the state. So I am going to hand this off to Josh now. Great, thanks, Christina. Mm -hmm. um, can, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, let's see if I can get this moving, there we go. So I will admit that um, a lot of, I've only been at the uh, department for, for six months, but already the landscape has changed the, uh, with NHD, as you are all aware. And so some of this was written, actually all of this was written before the call to action. Um, and I haven't really thought too much about how um, that will change things, but I'm sure you know, we will have to evolve as, as that uh, program evolves. First off, I wanted to address, um, and this is actually directly from USGS, that hydrography serves two general purposes. One is cartography and one is analysis. And, and both of those I think are really important. Um, but what I believe we're finding is as the analysis becomes more and more refined and the other data sets are becoming more and more accurate, we're requiring more and more accuracy, more precision out of our NHD line work and uh, polygon work. In fact, all of the NHD products. Um, but NHD is very well set up for doing both the cartography and the analysis. And within Washington state particularly, there's a lot, of, a lot of uses for NHD and hydrography data. And like Christina was just mentioning, critical areas are becoming a, a forefront of, of interest. Um, actually, they have been for a while. We have a, a lot of uh, streams within Washington state and protecting them is, is important both at the state and local government level. Uh, management and permitting, cartography, like I was mentioning before, navigation, legal boundary descriptions within the science realm, both monitoring and experiments, and emergency response and planning. And like I said, all of these can benefit from uh, improved accuracy. The other thing I wanted to address is that NHD is mostly focused on location. There's some attribute information, but it is really well designed to accommodate additional attributes to hang off of it. Um, fish presence, temperature monitoring, outflow. Um, and we in Washington State, both within ecology and WDFW have already uh, adopted this idea of using linear events to map your attributes to the NHD. Um, but again, it's only the attributes 
location is only as accurate as the NHD data itself. Here's a, an example um, of how inaccurate data can cause issues. And this is a, a real world example from uh, the area that I worked, Skagit County, for 20 years before coming to Department of Ecology. Um, it's a uh, pretty diverse county uh, going from sea level and estuary habitats all the way up to uh, mountainous 9,000 foot mountains. And uh, we do have a strong agricultural presence, second largest producer of, of uh, tulip bulbs in the world. And uh, because of that, there, the protection of streams through uh, agricultural areas has been in debate for over 20, 25 years. But in this example, you can see where a riparian analysis that was done on a, on a stream that is the yellow dash line, um, creating the red um, analysis area, um, is completely missing the actual stream location and the actual buffer that exists there. So um, as a, this is a great example of how these errors can perpetuate and cause inaccurate analysis. And I, I've been trying to think about how to best explain this. And so you guys are actually my guinea pigs. I only came up with this recently. But if you imagine a stream, which is the blue line, and a perfectly compliant vegetation buffer of 100 feet on either side, which is that green box, as we are doing our analysis, we are going to get very good results if our data is accurate. However, if, if that line moves and our analysis buffer window moves off of that, we are going to have, in this case, a measurement of no uh, vegetation buffer. And so what's interesting is I think there is this introduced bias of error so that the more error you have, um, as we see in the graph on the x x-axis, as you increase the error, you're going to decrease your measured area of the actual um, landscape feature you're trying to measure. That's assuming, of course, that these things are associated with the stream, if they're heavily associated. If it's a random pattern, it's not a big deal, but riparian areas, at least in agricultural areas, are heavily associated with streams. So as we increase error, uh, we are going to decrease down to zero uh, the amount of vegetation that we are measuring. And so that's just one example of the importance of having accurate hydrography. The other um, important thing is the challenge of working with disparate line data sets. And um, to be quite honest, I, I've mostly in my GIS career of 30 years, I've mostly worked with points and I've mostly worked with polygons. And lines were just features <clears throat> that we either buffer or something like that. But when you're trying to compare one line to another and the attributes that are on it, it gets really tricky, as you all know. So that's why I'm really, I'm really glad Washington does have a standard of using NHD as the primary. Um, but in the meantime, we still have some different data sets. And the challenge with those, as in this example where we have NHD, and again, this is a real world example. Here we have the, our Department of Natural Resource data. Often it's more accurate, um, but not always. And um, in this case, we have two different lines that intersect one of the NHD lines. So if we're trying to figure out attributes, what do, which attribute goes to which line? How could we compare this? And as an example, maybe that middle line has fish and the lower one doesn't. Does that mean the entire NHD line has fish or it doesn't have fish? Unfortunately, I don't think there's an, a way to process this automatically. I think this requires very time intensive analysis of trying to figure out which one is the correct one. And I, um, so I thought, well, LIDAR is going to save us. So here's an example of LIDAR. It, it definitely, you know, I think we have a lot more faith in LIDAR, but it's not necessarily going to be a, a, a push button solution. We still have the same issue of, now we have three different lines that we have to compare and try and figure out which one has the correct attribute information. So accuracy of hydrography, I think, is going to be one of our big challenges. Um, and, and moving everything to a single hydrography, I think, is going to be by far the best solution for the state as well as local governments. I also wanted to talk, you're all familiar with WBD. Um, 
usually in my talks that when I'm talking to local jurisdictions, I explain it as a nested uh, basin uh, system, which is really great. Um, it has not been used historically a lot by local government in Washington state, but it's getting a lot of interest. Um, <clears throat> we have quite a few Huck 8s uh, within the state. We have 72 units. Um, and as you know, the, the HU-12s go uh, nationwide and we have 2000 of those within the, within the state. But what we're seeing is a lot of local governments are interested in developing the HU-14 or the HU-16 for catchment analysis, doing things like NPDES and water quality. So um, we're really excited to help support that as well um, as kind of a, I think it's a little bit more of a robust base and analysis because of that nested approach and because it also works directly or it's, it's connected with the NHD. So we've talked about the need for accuracy and, um, and how there is definitely an interest within local government and state agencies. What are the strategies for updating NHD? And like I said, this was written before the call for action came out. So um, I apologize if some of it seems to be uh, disregarding that, but I think some of it is, in, most of it is in close alignment with what USGS is proposing. Within, so what are we dealing with within in Washington state? I, I quickly wanted to get a handle of what are we, how, how much editing are we talking about? We have a quarter million miles of streamed flow, flow lines that are currently in NHD within Washington state. And you know, what's scary to me is that with LIDAR, I can expect that we can probably expect a densification of that and an increase. But if you took all quarter million miles of streams, that, that'll wrap around the world 10 times. That's a lot of streams to update, particularly if we're going to think that we're going to do it with manual processing, uh, heads up digitizing, inspection of every se segment. It, it, th that's probably not going to be achieved. Secondly, we have a lot of rain <laughs> within Washington State. And this is another graphic that I was, I've been playing around with. I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite done with it yet, but I'm trying to get the idea across that we have a lot of rain. Um, in, in Western Washington, we have upwards of 11 feet annually of precipitation, and that goes down to as low as half a foot in Eastern Washington. And that creates an annual rainfall of 50 trillion gallons of water. And I was having a hard time visualizing uh, what 50 trillion gallons, as you saw with the wrapping up um, stream miles around the earth, I, I love analogies. So I started to do a little tinkering with a calculator and I thought, okay, well, how many Exxon Valdez tankers is that? Well, that's enough rain to fill a million oil tankers. That's still kind of a hard number to fathom. So I, 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 I took it apart. That's if we were to break the annual rainfall per day, that's 2,700 oil tankers of water per day. If we were to line those Exxon Valdez uh, tankers up end to end, they would reach from Seattle to Missoula, Montana, and that would be in one day of rainfall. So we have a lot of water falling down, going through amazing processes as it flows uh, from the atmosphere some of it, lots of it back down to the ocean and a lot of it going back into precipitation. But that whole process is so critical for understanding the, the movement of water, protection of water and these life cycles. So that brings us to LIDAR, which for Washington state is just an amazing, uh, powerful data source because we have a lot of tall trees in our rural areas and it makes it very challenging to figure out what's going on the ground. And LIDAR does a fantastic job of revealing what's going on with the bare earth. Um, and for those of us that have played with LIDAR, you can easily get sucked into exploring and um, discovering it's almost like putting x-ray glasses on and all of a sudden you can see all this uh, uh, amazing topology uh, information. But it also, as you all know, works very well for modeling where we expect water to flow. And um, using um, flow analysis, we can figure out where one cell is going to flow to the next and predict uh, based on that where we expect to see water on the landscape. And this will become the basis for the 3DHP, the hydrography program. Um, so 
uh, it's a fantastic tool. and We're very excited uh, that this is going to be an option. But as someone who's uh, dabbled, I would not say I'm a LIDAR expert, but I've dabbled with LIDAR. Um, there, I do have some concerns, particularly in Washington state, where we have a variety of landscapes, both mountainous areas, but then usually coming down into these kind of alluvial flat areas. Um, and when we compare the, those different landscapes, I think we can safely say LIDAR is going to be very effective at predicting quite accurately without too much extra work where stream flows are in the mountainous areas. Problem is when you get down into these flat areas, you have remnant channels that have been orphaned uh, thousands of years ago as a stream moves around. We have alluvium that just does all kinds of below ground strange things. And again, I'm not a, I, I can't tell you any more than strange because I'm not a hydrology expert, but I have seen where streams flow off of the mountains and just disappear into alluvium. And I've seen where we run models of LIDAR expected flow and we get all kinds of strange patterns on these very flat areas. And so what I started to kind of conceptualize was what's happening as we move from these rural to urban gradients. Um, and there's some things we can, we know for a fact, um, in, at least in Washington state, uh, population is going to increase. As population increases, we see an increase in hydro modification. So all those hydro modifications, whether it's canals, ditches, culverts, all of that uh, creates a little bit more challenges when we're doing our LIDAR modeling. We also, as we move from the uh, mountainous areas to the uh, more developed areas, we're gonna see a decrease in elevation and we're also gonna see a decrease in slope. And we're also gonna see a decrease in tree cover. So all of these are going to affect um, the efficiency of using LIDAR data to predict where streams are and water bodies in general. So I have kind of come up with this generalized diagram to explain kind of what I'm thinking about here, where on the, on the um, y-axis, we have the best data source uh, on, in the rural areas and the mountainous areas, that's for sure going to be LIDAR. In the cities and populated areas, probably going to rely more and more on local knowledge and understanding uh, this relationship, I think is going to be really critical as we move forward. What we're hoping is that we can move that um, influence area that, or the, the best data source of LIDAR and move it so that we actually have most of the landscape being assessed with LIDAR. But I think it's gonna be inevitable that there's going to be a reliance on local knowledge um, as we get into those heavily modified uh, landscapes. If you, um, to relate that to Washington state, we can see that these census urbanized areas are typically in the lower elevations, whereas the steeper elevations that will be easy, easier to model uh, with LIDAR are kind of focused along the central cascades, the Olympic Peninsula and the more rural areas. So um, I think the challenge is going to be where, where does that intersect of LIDAR and local knowledge um, meet and how can we get that as close to or within these urbanized areas as possible. The other thing um, that we're kind of gearing up for is if, if we acknowledge that we are going to rely on local knowledge, most, in fact, I believe a study was done by WDFW that was looking at what are local government agencies using for hydrography. None of them are using NHD, unfortunately. They're all using uh, the department, a variation of Department of Natural Resource. They're, most of them are actually doing their own editing. And so, we want to work on a way to help both get that information and make it worthwhile for these local government agencies to, to get the data from us and rely on it themselves so that we're all working on the single data set. And I was getting confused with the different roles that people have. So I put this uh, little graphic together as a proposed concept where we have USGS uh, in the cloud of NHD data and, and the state stewards feed their updates and changes to the US NHD. And we also, I don't wanna disregard the fact that we have, particularly in Washington state, federal um, steward partners. Uh, we have US Forest Service, there's some BLM and there's National Park, I think. And so they also have their direct agreements and they're feeding directly to USGS as well. And in the past, we've been mostly just working with people like 
me when I was at the Skagit County, I was a GIS editor and I would say, well, here's our hydro data and I'd give it to the state steward and um, Anita would have to do quite a bit of processing before she could get that submitted. And so the idea might be that we actually have NHD trained editors at local government who at least understand the concepts of NHD and as they're making changes are not making my life more difficult trying to submit it to USGS. And if we take that one step further, we might have some of our more, uh, um, our, some of our larger local government agencies where they might have their own NHD expert who's working full time to do the editing, has done the edit, um, edit training with NHD, has worked on checking data in, checking out, and working collaboratively with me as the state steward will submit that information to USGS. And that will hopefully create less of a bottleneck with me getting lots of information updated. We also wanna make sure that we're involving coordinators, department heads, people who are often decision makers because uh, things do not happen if, decision, if those folks are not involved. And, and so they um, can work through their own team, uh, but we, you know, we also have access to the USGS markup tool. And I know that under the call to action, the markup tool is gonna get even more use. Um, in Washington state, it's not heavily used, but it is something that I wanna make sure that more and more people have access to, especially at kind of that GIS editor coordinator level to submit changes as needed and as they're discovering them. And lastly, the end user. Um, what do um, just all of our very active GIS users within Washington state, how do they submit changes when they see errors? And so essentially, I mean, we're trying to create almost like a crowdsource approach to updating NHD um, and very probably not too unlike uh, open source and, and Google, uh, but we're just trying to make sure that it has a little bit more control because it is such a complex data set. But I just wanted to get all this um, relationships and, and naming out there so that we can use a common language when we are working with our stakeholders. And we do have um, a variety of stakeholders across the state um, with just cities that are over 6,000 in population. We have 117. A lot of those are using GIS to one, one, in one way or another, and many of them are interested in hydrography. We have 39 counties, and then we have our federal, tribal, and state um, different organizations that have different interests in different parts of the landscape, and there's lots of overlap. And so I want to make sure that as um, different jurisdictions are making changes, if it overlaps with another jurisdiction, that there is some form of communication before that um, information is submitted. So that um, if a city is uh, doing some remapping and it contradicts what the county or tribe believes is actually going on, we have those discussions early. Uh, maybe we do some additional ground truthing or some additional research before we submit so that we don't end up with this circular, one person changes it, another person changes it back. And I think these regional review teams can also bring and work as a way to collaboratively bring people together. So um, we hope to uh, help support this type of um, review as well as making sure we help people understand the different overlaps of jurisdictions. So what are some of the next steps? Um, what are we thinking about in the future? Um, we already have a, a story map um, that's available and uh, that was put together by Anita and Brad. It's, an, it's really a great example of a story map and all of the information is very pertinent. So we have no plans in, in taking that down. We hope just to build off of that. Um, I did create a survey one, two, three for um, Washington Hydro users. We got quite a few responses uh, back, I think over 40, close to 50. Most, almost all those people, I think, except for one said, we are interested in being um, connected with hydrography and the discussions you're going to continue having, maybe some form of a stakeholder. Um, so that's a great start. That's just within the last couple of months. Um, we're also working on a web page so that we can have a good communication with latest news, uh, discussion boards. And we've also, um, I haven't really talked about it, but you can see there, we have a logo, the WA NHD. And I felt this was an important thing to establish is that the Washington NHD is not just an ecology. I'm the steward and I'm in ecology. 
But Washington NHD is a statewide program that anyone who is um, vested in hydrography is a part of. And so I wanted to create that unique identity that people say, oh, WA-NHD, both as a trusted source of information, but also as an organization that people participate in, become stakeholders, and give feedback. So um, as if I haven't said collaboration enough um, during this talk, uh, we do have our stakeholder group that I hope to continue to build. Uh, we hope to have some future made meetings, training opportunities. We, also, we already had a, a great um, uh, opportunity where the WBD staff said they would be willing to do a 101 training for one of our counties. And just sending out to that immediate stakeholder group that I just recently set up, I think we already have like 18 people signed up. Uh, to take that 101 class. So that's a great example of how I think there's a thirst for information and understanding how to do things better, particularly in Washington state. We have a very active GIS community. Our Washington GIS Association has over 300 members. We do annual meetings. And that's another, um, that's actually where I first gave this presentation and how I got a lot of interest from local GIS users. So building off of that, keeping that momentum going. Um, we hope that there's continued funding opportunities. Like Christina said, we're making a request to the state. We're hoping uh, before too long with the call to action that the AA has set up and that we can do some partnering with USGS uh, as we move forward in, in improving our LIDAR. Um, and in the meantime, um, we will continue uh, kind of piecing away at those changes one by one as they come in um, and working on some of those special projects uh, grant projects that we already have going on. And uh, Christina alluded already that we have a pilot project. That's one of the big projects that we are requesting uh, through, um, through the state, part of this Governor's Riparian Protection and Restoration Work Group um, that identified the need to improve NHD. But I was reluctant to just say, well, here's how much it's gonna cost to do the entire state without first doing a little research specific to Washington, specific to uh, the landscapes and the, and the GIS capabilities of our local government and our, uh, and our state agencies. So um, the proposed uh, area is north of Seattle, south of Bellingham on the Stiligwamish. Uh, we have very good LIDAR for that area already. We also have a, um, a county and city that are very interested in participating. Um, and what we hope to do is work with one of the gypsy contractors to compare some of the EDH methods that they use versus um, some other approaches, which one of them would be geomorphons, which I'll talk about in a second, and also um, trying to figure out what role land cover can play, particularly with water bodies, water areas, wetlands, um, as we are trying to build out our NHD to be more accurate. So um, all of that would be kind of a comparison within a, this is a smaller watershed, a smaller HUC, uh, HU8 within uh, Washington. So real quickly, geomorphons, for those of you that are not familiar, I, it's I know been mentioned in previous talks quickly, but it's kind of a newer approach, I think dating back to like 2013, and it's used to classify terrain patterns. Um, it goes beyond the immediate cells, which our flow often is constrained to, and it looks at line of sight and it creates a possibility of 498 landforms that are then grouped into 10 common categories. Um, geomorphons are scale and orientation independent. And, um, and so, I'm sorry, they, they, the orient independent geomorphic features, the features are independent. And um, so we are planning on working with Professor Matt Baker at University of Maryland, who's done quite a bit of this work uh, using geomorphons to map Chesapeake Bay area. And we're curious to see, does it provide any advantages, um, added value if we were to try and use it in Washington state? So that would be a part of the pilot project. And then lastly, um, we are hoping to work with local agencies. Like I mentioned, uh, there's a very active, uh, Snohomish County is very active. They have some fantastic uh, stream water programs already in place. They've been very active in modeling and um, creating an improved hydro frame, uh, hydro uh, um, land cover for themselves, a land cover layer for themselves. And so one of the things we're interested in is, well, how much effort is it going to take to, to find 
where does LIDAR work the best? How do we get that local government data into NHD and create the best data? So we're hoping that uh, through this project, through we will get a better understanding of what is the best path forward uh, to, to do the rest of the state with this combination of LIDAR um, and, and local government and imagery. So uh, that's a it's pretty exciting project. Um, if the funding were to get approved, it would start next summer. But we are actually going to try and do a little bit of a, uh, a beginning role of geomorphons this fall, as early as this fall with a little seed money. And so this project actually could kick off much earlier than next summer. That's all that I have. I'm sorry, I wasn't keeping track of the chat in case there's questions, but I'm happy to have, take questions. I'm also happy to talk afterwards at any time. That's my email there. And uh, I'm, I am actually really hoping I'll be at the annual meeting because that'd be another fantastic uh, place to, to share ideas. But um, with that, I wanna thank you very much. And um, Christina and I are happy to take questions at any time, either now or in the future. Thank you very much, Josh. Very helpful. Um, I can't wait to see your work with the geomorphons. That's uh, going to be especially interesting. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Phil to monitor questions. Phil, I don't know if there was something earlier in the chat. Not, not that I saw. I think the one you just typed was uh, uh, the first one. Uh, which is what is the source slash lineage of the state hydrography data set used by local governments? That's a good question. It so um, I believe um, it's a combination. I think many things, um, if you were to do the, uh, the birth tree of hydrography uh, in Washington state, I think a lot of it evolved from early um, NHD, early, uh, blue line data, but then also um, had a big push from our Department of Natural Resources. And so for a long time, uh, and actually still, Department of Natural Resources maintains their own hydrography. And I would say up to about 15, 12 years ago, a lot of agencies would use that verbatim. But since then, a lot of them have kind of gone their own. They've taken that as a start and modified it. And a lot of NHD actually, I think, traces back to the Department of Natural Resource data as well. So we have, um, these, are, these are not independent families. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So do, do you have an understanding of why the, uh, the, the data has diverged and why locals are maintaining their own? Is, is there some, something that's not happening at a national level or a state level that, that they need? Yeah, you know, so that's a tough one. I can only, um, I can only answer, that's a, that'd be a great survey question. Um, but I would say, so from my experience working in, in county for 20 years, the frustration we had was if data could not be updated quickly enough um, or even updated easily, then we would, it was easier just to make, keep our own data. And I think that is the answer to both the NHD and DNR um, uh, lack of use. Uh, the, the DNR was quite adequate, but most of the changes that would go through Department of Natural Resources were associated with forest permits. So in urbanized areas where you're not getting forest permits, it was much more challenging um, to, to request a change. And so I think it was that flexibility and just being able to move the line uh, where your field techs say it should be and, having, and knowing that it's gonna happen um, and not take you know, two, five years for it to eventually show up. Okay. So that's my guess. That's, that's my guess. And I think most, I would guess most agencies would say it, just ease of updating. So now I'm gonna put you on the spot. You, you, oh, have yeah. some, you have some familiarity with the new markup tool uh, that USGS has. Uh, yeah. do, do you see it solving the problem that you just described? <sighs> well, um, <laughs> I know there's some USGS people on here, so, so I'm gonna be, I'm, but, I, but I'm, I'm always a very honest person. So, so that I'm not trying to butter this up at all. I think the markup tool can solve it. It's great at accepting the, the requests, but we have to also make sure both as stewards and USGS that we get those requests into the system. And, and I'm, whereas I might've been the bottleneck before, I'm a little worried that the, just the markup tool, not that the markup tool is any 
bottleneck, but it, you know, it is, we can blame it on the markup tool, but it's still coming down to you, the, the steward and USGS taking all those edits. And, um, you know, I, we had a, we had an, a meeting with Google uh, a year ago talking about Google updates. I don't know if, if any of you have ever done this, but if you see a mistake in Google, it's not that difficult to go in and make a request for a change. That's something they implemented not too long ago. They implemented it and they quickly got completely overwhelmed <laughs> with, with change requests to the point that they couldn't, I think after a year, they're maybe barely starting to dig out of some of the earliest requests. And I'm a little bit of, I, that's my only concern is can we keep up with all the requests using a tool like Markup, which is a little bit one by one type of changes. And, and I will just make a comment. I think that um, one of the challenges is that our NHD shop has been really um, mostly a shop of one. <clears throat> and we've utilized grant funding to hire project positions to work specifically on uh, updates. Like for instance, we had a grant that was updating uh, NHD, sorry, I have a dog barking in the background, NHD, um, within King County specifically for their stormwater, working on their stormwater outfalls. And so then that project position is working on that specific update. And uh, and then the NHD steward is trying to work on high priority update requests that are coming in. But we really, I mean, part of this request that we have for the, um, to, for our uh, legislature request is really to help identify what what are the resources we need to to be able to meet the needs of our local jurisdictions and 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 have that you know get those updates done either through you know high resolution lidar and technology or through incorporating local jurisdiction da data where that's necessary and and i think um i'm sure becky could jump in on this or al but i but I'm, I think the, the way that things are written in the um, call to action is the concept that you, we are going to get the hydrography 99.8% accurate to begin with, and then really kick in the markup tool just to deal with those, the little changes. I don't, I don't think the markup tools is envisioned uh, to, to be the, the mass update tool. So, um, so I'll, I'll throw that out also. Yeah. Yeah, Josh, this is this is Becky Anderson with USGS. I was just gonna say the same thing that um, I think all of your concerns are really valid about if we just cracked this open for our only solution for the NHD right now. Um, but the concept going forward is that we spend a lot more time on the front end, um, not only collecting and, and really having these um, features derived with specifications and methodologies that really work, but also that as long as they're a gypsy project, they're going through an inspection as a part of um, that process. And, and regardless, even if they were contributed, we need them to go through an inspection process to get into the 3D HP so that we're, we're looking at these pretty carefully on the front end, but we still want to make sure that we give the community just in general, a methodology to say, hey, you got 99.8% right, but you know, it's still messed up in this one little place and you need to fix it um, just so that we aren't lo completely locking it in. But I do believe that it's it's going to be for small changes and not for um, rerouting a whole river, for example. Yeah, Josh, I think your slide that you showed earlier showing that kind of stewardship partnership thing with all the arrows and all the different <laughs> things, I, I think that, that though, I think would go a long way to potentially crowdsourcing or getting the locals involved in in feeding that last two percent like Becky's talking about yeah no that, that makes makes a lot of good sense it, that's that's very rough it started off <laughs> it started off with I'm just going to put three things and all of a sudden I people said oh well don't forget this group and don't forget that and all this I apologize that it got complicated but I would also really uh, be curious what other folks think um, how that could be modified or improved as well. But yeah, thanks, Phil. I, I do think it gives a little, it, it lets pe the people know, where do I fit into this process? And I think that's really important that people understand they are a part of the process and where do, where do, what is their role? So I wanted to make that clear up front. All right, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, there's, let's see. Uh, there's oh, I see we got David. David's on the line, so that's awesome. He's, um, 
working with uh, Dr. Baker. So that's a, a great, yeah. great that he chimed in too. So there's, there's quite a bit about geomorphons in here. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, and Matt's here also. Oh, yeah. awesome. Becky, do you want do you want to uh, do you want to just read your comment or say your comment out loud because um I I want to I want to do it justice. Sure. Yeah. I was I was just kind of um, my understanding is that uh, it, in the presentation it felt a little bit like it was EDH or geomorphons. I'm not sure if that's um what was meant though. So maybe that was just the way I I kind of took it or understood it. And my understanding is that, uh, at least with some of the people who've been deriving the elevation derived hydrography, they're using geomorphons as a part of the process. So they're actually using it within process to get a better result um, rather than something separate. So it's just kind of asking, because I know we've got a great group of people on here, a lot of people on the call who are actively working on this. So it's just kind of seeing if I was right about that or misunderstanding it. Um, so yeah. we heard yes. from Ellen and Nisha and David that um, yep. you know they're using it. So anyway, I was just kind of curious about that, or maybe any more. It, it'd be interesting to hear more about the the geomorphons piece and how you guys might utilize that as a check or what you think it might bring. Yeah, and and I'm I am <laughs> I am far from an expert, especially compared to some of the folks online here. But uh, so they they can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think one of the really cool um, advantages of using the straight geomorphon approach is you do not have to put in your blockages, your culverts, uh, for it to create a solution. In some ways, it actually finds those blockages and highlights those. And we don't have a perfect culvert database, um, particularly in rural areas. Um, and by perfect, I mean both knowing where they are and their exact location. So, um, so. I'm curious to see does the, what kind of information does the geomorphon approach provide, as well as it provides a bank width and bank height, which is super um, info, informative for some of our research scientists, as well as uh, being useful for critical areas monitoring. And so you're right, I, I, I'm totally open to a combination of um, approaches, but that's kind of what we are, um, that's what we are going to be to, to be digging into is is one better than the other or is really a blend of all of this going to be the magic uh, secret sauce that's what i'm hoping for I, i'm looking for the secret sauce that is a cost efficient solution to get some really accurate data moving forward and um you know and i'm not talking about just flow lines either i'm you know we're very interested in delineating um, the water body, water areas associated with those flow lines, particularly in these wetland areas. We get a lot of these areas where you actually don't even have a discernible stream channel, just a big giant wetland <clears throat> area that water flows in and flows out. Deline delineating that has always been a huge challenge, but finding the edge of that is critical for uh, protecting those resources. So that's a little bit of a windy uh, answer, but um, I'm sure if... Uh, someone else wants to chime in, uh, you know, I think, I know um, there's actually, uh, Professor Matt Baker did a presentation, I think almost a year ago, and, uh, and, and you can find that. I think it was to uh, NISJIC. It was either to NISJIC or USGS. Uh, Matt, you can chime in, but I, I, that is, I can actually provide the link for that. It, it was a great presentation. Yeah, and this is Becky again. I'm interested if, um, if, if while you guys are doing that work or when you're done with that work, if you find that, you know, well, it was useful in deriving a stream network this way, but hey, like you just said, you know, here's other maybe secondary products that we could pull out of it or other things that would be useful to integrate as a part of a larger new 3D HP concept. I, I'd be really interested in getting you guys' feedback on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hope um, to be working closely with you throughout that. It's, it's scheduled to be a two-year program, but I'm hoping to really front end a lot of the, the analysis so that we can maybe gear up for doing the rest of the state, at least getting some proposals in with, with some preliminary information. But yes, absolutely. I agree with everything you said. Um, let's see, Linda was asking, on the outreach and engagement with the tribal community? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so 
uh, there is a tribal organization uh, that works on the Stillaguamish, and I've actually also been in touch with um, some of other tribal hydro analysts um, to get a little bit of guidance as we work through the, uh, th this pilot project. But um, we also, within our project, we allocated a small amount of money to work with agencies or organizations outside of the pilot area, local government, tribal organizations. And we actually are hoping, I know there's a, several tribes that have already done quite a bit of um, hydro correction using LIDAR data. And so we're hoping to see how, um, how much time does it take to get that data implemented into NHD also. So that's, um, it's kind of some of the, it's a little bit further down in the project description. Um, and it's, it's not as well defined, I wouldn't say, but that is definitely one of our goals. Well, I'm gonna interrupt and uh, move us towards the um, closing questions that we always, our interview questions. Let me share that screen. So, what would you say is the, and again, you're in this process, so it's a little bit difficult to ask, but given where you are in the process, is there anything looking back that you would have done differently? That's a good question. Um, in relation to how, how we manage NHD for Washington? Yes. Um, I would say that um, really probably, I would say having a larger um, NHD team probably with something, uh, recognizing the need to uh, keep up with that, that, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. So just recognizing the magnitude of the task. Yeah. Um, in this process, what surprised you? Oh, Josh. Uh, no. Well, I'll throw out what one. What has um, surprised you? Is that well, the best? <laughs> no, I think I've been, I've been trying to keep up this whole time. I feel like I, I hit the ground on a, on a conveyor belt that was going twice the speed I can run. <laughs> uh, I, I would say one thing that really surprised me was even with all the effort that has been put into updating NHD through grants and uh, even working with a county that I used to work at, when I took a projection of how much has been updated versus how much more we have to do, it was going to, it's going to take us 20 years um, to keep going at the rate we're going. And that's just not, that's not going to work. Uh, there's, uh, we, we need this data accurate, you know, every, like everyone says, we need it accurate yesterday. So um, that, 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 really, that really surprised me. We, we have to step up our updating speed quite a bit. Um, after that, the, the call for action came out. So I'm really glad to see that that's moving forward. Um, you know, probably like many people, we're hoping that we can get it done before 10 years um, so that we can start using the data uh, even earlier. Very good. So other um, than the data, well, I'll just, this question probably doesn't apply this well, but what resources did you find the most valuable in the pr process? What resources have you, I don't know if it's discovered or um, as you're going along, what are the tools you're depending on the most? And, and I mean by that information, tools, documentations, online resources. You're going to think I'm... Um buttering pandering, up, pandering. <laughs> but this group this group has been awesome um this group has been awesome the the usgs monthly talks and sharing have been awesome uh it's been definitely a challenge for me personally coming on board uh during a pandemic and not being able to meet people in person but having these uh sharing opportunities through zoom and teams and virtually it's been invaluable so um that that would be one for me you're not hurting my feelings at all. That's, <laughs> um, no, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that, that's great. 
And so what, what are the resource needs out there? What are the things we, we really need? Um, again, not just tools, but documents, standards online. What are the things you think would help move um, your efforts further, faster, stronger? Besides money? Well, no. That works. <laughs> lots, lots and lots and lots of money. No, I think... Um, I think it's becoming clear to me that even in a perfect world, we're not going to be able to staff up to to, to handle the state. So we're gonna we're going to have to re, you know, to rely on probably either USGS or more likely a private private or you know gypsy contractor to do a lot of the the lion's share of the, the work. Um, so I don't I don't think that if we want to get stuff done quickly. Um, I, I don't think it makes sense for us to to hire a staff of 15 people short term. That makes sense. All right. Well, I want to thank um, both Josh and Christina for joining us today and sharing this information. Um, it's really interesting as we're working as the different states present to see both where they are in the process, uh, the priorities and the challenges they're facing. Um, you know that we have the webinar er, the third Wednesday of each month, 3 to 4 p.m. Sometimes it goes to 4.05. Um, we will not have a September forum due to the NISJIC annual conference, but I am glad to say that we'll be talking with New York on their NHD improvements project on Wednesday, October 20th. Um, and again, thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to, for USGS for their continued support, and thank you to the NISJIC community for just contributing your knowledge and sharing your, your thoughts and ideas. See you in a couple months. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks.